This is Up Close, I'm Stephen I. Weiss. In this week's episode, we are uncovering the significance of ancient settlements, early Native Americans from 9,000 years ago, and Jewish life in the Catskills. It's a bygone era that is now only available in memories and media, but when Jews vacationed extensively in the Catskills, it was a lifestyle that brought celebrity and glamour to shuffleboard and buffets. Stephen Silverman discusses the diverse and surprising narrative in the Catskills, its history, and how it changed America. And then, sometimes to go digging into our past, we literally have to go digging. What we find can remind us of ourselves or give us a new sense of the breadth of human traditions. Appalachian State University professor Cheryl Clausen discusses beliefs and rituals in archaic Eastern North America, an interpretive guide. But first, here's my interview with Stephen Silverman. So, how many times did you have to watch Dirty Dancing in order to write this book? The truth? I reviewed it when it first came out. I was the movie critic of the New York Post. But something, t I didn't like it, but I, I knew to step around it. And it really left my head. And w when the book was just about to come out, I woke up one morning at two. And among the things I was worried about was, you know, people are going to ask me about Dirty Dancing. I haven't seen it. So I watched it on Amazon Prime. Yeah. It's and pretty terrible. It's not a great movie. It's terrible. It right. has every cliche in the book. So I've seen it twice, right. to answer you, in a right. long yeah. roundabout fashion. And it fashion. does have, like, there's a picture of it. It gets some mention. I had to yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it was very popular. Right. And so I think that speaks to, I mean, both as a contemporary culture point broadly in America and as the Jewish community, we have this one very, very specific notion of what the Catskills is and was, right? But it's like, it's kind of like yes. this, 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 um, this point through which America formed itself at many points. Right. Well, so much took place up there. Mind you, I too went into this project thinking it's always been Jewish. It's been anything but. I mean, it was a bastion of anti-Semitism till around 1914. But you know, the first American school of painting, the Hudson River School, Thomas Cole, all that started in the Catskills. Uh, the first American short story was, well, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, but it was followed very closely by Rip Van Winkle. Where did it take place? The Catskills. The first American novel was the last of the Mohicans. Where did that take place? The Catskills. Right. Well, you know, where did we get our bluestone to pave New York City streets and Philadelphia streets? The Catskills. And all leather tanning was from trees that were ripped out of the Catskills. A lot went on there, and New York City water comes from there. What do you think happens when a location kind of iterates and becomes the face of America in different ways again and again, but for very different reasons? Well, that's wonderful. I mean, it works to its advantage, yeah. obviously. You know, that it happened, I, I don't think you can, you really can't nail down the explanation why any more than you can say, well, well, it's sort of easier to explain why it attracted the variety of people it attracted, all of whom were slightly lunatic. Uh, but you know, <laughs> Including the resort goers in well, the 50s and 60s. <laughs> including the authors yeah. to cover it. No, um, but... <laughs> Um, you know, it was so far away from New York and yet close enough that it, you could leave here and form a completely new identity up there. So it lent itself to that. There's clearly something about the beauty to be found there, right? Because that's, yeah. that's that talked was about. The, that was the initial magnet. Again. That's why the, the first real mountain house was built there, the Catskill Mountain House, in 1825, before there were mountain houses anywhere else in the country. But what brought the people there, the thing they sold, you know, sort of the rides, <laughs> was, was the scenery. And people wept when they saw it. They'd never seen anything like it. And one thing that came together for me reviewing this uh, in your history is, is that you have this kind of projection of fantasy. Is that like, whatever your fantasy is? Right. You know, it, it, it gets projected there, and then, and and it was interesting to to review the Catskills history of the of the resort era, mm. in that sense where you had, it was you know these these hotels were constantly changing a, into whatever city people decided was was what they were looking for, or whatever well, the hotel they, owners they all, decided. Yeah, they, but uh, the one I focused on. Chiefly, I mean, I touch upon m most of the hotels up there, but I mean, I focus on Jenny Grossinger because to me she was such a fascinating character. Number one, she was a woman entrepreneur in an era when that just didn't happen in America. She was Jewish, uh, which, you know, and it's a Horatio Alger story. She was an immigrant who did not really, she was not schooled, 
and she was not a great conversationalist, and yet she was the mo one of the most charismatic figures New York State has ever known. And she built this institution that essentially set the model for, you know, what the gangsters in Las Vegas would model their early hotel, their resorts after, what Disney World became, an all-in-one inclusive, and what today, especially the cruise ship industry, you know, you're on board, you're here, we'll give you the entertainment and we'll give you all you can eat. She, she launched that. It's easy for us now to look back at that and, and see the cheesiness and this or that and the other stuff. But at the same, but, but you see that looking back at Las Vegas, you see that looking back at, 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 at almost anything anyone did some generation yeah. prior. And, and, you know, and that's also something that comes through in your book is this idea that it is the reality that everybody was in on it, that, every, uh, that, uh, that, that people were, were buying into this, people were wearing those clothes, people <laughs> were driving those cars. Yeah, yeah, flash meant a lot. But it was also, you know, Jews couldn't go anywhere uh, to any hotel they chose back then. Uh, it was the country, must, most of it was completely restricted. They were, everybody was free to, to do what they wanted to do up there as well, be, you know, the guests. And everyone sort of understood, you know, what was fun and what was interesting. So that, I, I think that's, that was a big part of it. How did that even get started? So, you, I mean, some of this goes, Grossers? wait, well, the whole, the whole big Jews going the Jews, up there, yeah, because yeah. because it goes pretty yeah. far back. What happened was there was the Catskill Mountain House that started the hospitality industry up there. Uh, <laughs> Sunday church service was mandatory. Well, what does that tell you? Who their clientele was, and Jews were kept out. I mean, the signs read: no dogs, no Jews. Hebrews will knock vainly for admission. It's not just that you're not allowed; you'll want to be here. Yeah, but you can't oh, get yeah, in. Right, right, right. <laughs> Well, and I have correspondence from hotel managers, you know, questioning the backgrounds of people with suspicious sounding last names. And, and one saying, well, I talked to, they stayed at a hotel in Philadelphia and they behaved themselves. So apparently they're not Jewish. Um, but what happened was at the, uh, around 1900, it was discovered that tuberculosis, which was running rampant all over the world, it was a killer. Um, and it used to be believed that if you went down south where it was warm, you would improve. Well, the warmth killed them, killed the patients. Instead, it was discovered initially in Switzerland and tried out in the Adirondacks, where a sanitarium opened, that clean, crisp, cool mountain air is what treated tuberculosis and in some cases got rid of it altogether. Well, the Catskills are closer than the Adirondacks, so a sanitarium opened in, Li in the town of Liberty, the Luma Sanitarium. And at the time, the only people who went up to the Catskills were rich people who could afford to stay in these very nice boarding houses or hotels, rich wasps. But then, you know, everyone, the consumptives from New York City started riding the same trains up to the Catskills as the rich people. And the, uh, sometimes coughing right in the, in the seat next to them. And then it was discovered that what was originally thought uh, tuberculosis was genetic wasn't at all, it was contagious. Well, you can imagine what happened. Everyone fled the Catskills. The real estate prices plummeted, and guess who moved in? So you've got a lot of classic Jewish tropes there of like, uh, of hypochondria, uh, <laughs> hypochondria, right? You've got and, and wanting and, to eat and and, and, and and right and 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 getting it on a good deal, right? And uh, and uh, and uh, and making other people flee. And, uh, <laughs> no, and, they no tuberculosis made them flee. But the fear of the Jew, right? Helped. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of unpleasant circumstances. Yeah. There were ugly yeah. incidents. Yeah. Uh, there was an artist colony. An artist colony. You're going to think, yeah. Not only were they left wing, but they're, you know they're Jewish. Very anti-Semitic. It was Birdcliff, and the uh, the founder's son was in on a thing to beat up the manager of a. Because what happened was the, the, the boarding houses that had been completely restricted were then bought by Jews. And, you know, where the sign said no, ju no Jews, it was changed to uh, dietary laws strictly observed. Um, so he was in on, you know, with his gang that beat up the manager. And the, his mother uh, went to court to defend him and said, my son wouldn't get within 10 feet of a Jew. Um, but yeah. <laughs> 
it, it you know, they, uh, some of the, uh, the Jews who went up there, it wasn't, they didn't want to open boarding houses. They wanted to farm like they could do in the old country sometimes, yeah. you know, if they were the overseer on a land owned by a Christian. But um, they went up to the Catskills to try and grow something. It was impossible because the, the soil was awful. It's all rocks. What you could, if you wanted to farm, you could have chickens and you could have cows. So you could have milk and eggs and butter and sour cream. Um, and they would make money by letting, uh, renting rooms to Jews from the Lower East Side. And I mean, that's how all that happened. Jews wanting, you know, fresh air, especially in the summer. We know what New York summers still are like. But back then there was no air conditioning. There was no escape to the suburbs. There was no jet travel to the Isle of Capri. One of the pictures that just blew my mind in, in here was of um, there's a, a bunch of people sunbathing, but they're bundled up in coats. And they've got <laughs> mirrors projecting the yeah. light onto their faces, and they're on a sun deck, but it's, it's the dead of winter. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Right. Well, these are 12-month tw uh, resorts, all four seasons, right. in time. It didn't start out that way. It was strictly a place right. to go in the summer. But the idea that you want to get away and yeah. right in, in the cold and go further north to where it's colder, into mountains where it's yet yeah. colder. Well, right. But also but you can find realize, your... you know, we didn't, look, also the sun wasn't as damaging back then as it is now with the ozone layer. But a tan was a sign of prosperity. You know, you, you were a person of leisure. So to have a tan in the dead of winter. You must really be a yeah. player. Yeah, exactly. Right. And being a player within that culture had its own thing. You, I mean, you have on the one hand, a, like a resort owner, you know, hanging out with Zero Mostel right. and, and so on. And, and, and there, there was a, there was a well, culture there was within a strata, the culture. Yeah, yeah. there was a, a social strata. And you know, some of the hotels were much better than the others. There was Grossinger's and right below it was uh, Concord. And then there were the others, Kutcher's and the Neville and Browns and whatnot. But, uh, and then there was the one and that there I, were bragging rights yeah. for, the guest, for the guests attached to, you know, whatever one you went to that sort of defined you. It was like the sort of car you drove. Did you, did you drive a Cadillac? Did you drive a Pontiac? Right. There was a difference. And then there's the one I visited in the, in the 90s for a friend's bar mitzvah, which is so far, which is the home of whack, which was- Yeah, well, yeah. that sounds right. I grew up in Los Angeles, yeah. so I did not experience this. I had Disneyland. But uh, I'm not complaining. Well, this is but like, I understand, uh, yeah. for some reason, through osmosis, yeah. I got what was going on up there. Right. Well, this says that this is Disneyland for Jews. It is. I mean, how, how does that reflect a difference, you know, I mean, in, in what people wanted and what, in what people felt they were missing and that they needed to get somewhere else? Well, what the resorts, they were called resorts and country clubs, and for a very good reason. Jews could not belong to country clubs in America. So they had their own. So it fulfilled every desire. Uh, whatever the other people had, not only do we have, we have more of it and we have it better. We have the best entertainers. We have more food than anybody. We have not only an indoor pool, we have an outdoor pool and it's bigger than yours. We have, you know, Milton Burrow when he opened the showroom at the Concord, said in next year they're gonna have an indoor mountain. <laughs> that also speaks to the decline of, of that era in, in Catskill's history of, of the resorts because well, right. you could go other places. Yeah, also. that's what happened. The Civil Rights Bill in 1964 did not just pertain to African Americans. It freed the Jews to stay at any Hilton hotel they wanted. Well, I don't, you know, I'm not saying Hilton discriminated. They could stay at any hotel in America, and they did. They also, you know, by then, the, the new generation come up. Kids didn't want to go where their parents went. And the stigma of going to Europe where the atrocities had taken place was being lifted, especially as far as the next generation was concerned. And there were low air fares. And there was the flight to the suburbs. You could have your own swimming pool. You had air conditioning. So, you know, there went the resorts. That really, that started the entire decline. And in some cases, it went very quickly. Others, it took a long time. I mean, Kutcher's only closed last year. You, you hadn't previously had, I guess, in the Jewish community at all, a, a culture of vacationing. And then, but then to have a culture of vacationing that was community-based, right? I, I mean, I've never really experienced that. Yeah. A lot of people haven't experienced that, that you, that you vacation as a, not as a family, but as a community. Right, uh, an extended family. We're also, I mean, we're focusing on the resorts, which of course is the easiest, but you know, we cannot overlook, you know, there are Cook Alliance, which were the, 
the most basic, and then up above that were the bungalow colonies. And, you know, generations went to the same bungalow colony. And, you know, it, the kids would all know each other from summer to summer. Uh, th then they might go get jobs at the, as waiters uh, in, in, in the expensive resorts. But I mean, there, you put your finger right on it. I mean, it was, it, these were communities. Following that decline, we had what what some of the, something that made the area very famous well the farms right and and they continue to be known for the farms and then one farm in particular became a cow pasture in in uh, <laughs> known as Woodstock which really wasn't in Woodstock um, but yeah 1969 you know I talk about how the, that generation didn't want to go and do what their parents did well if anything defined that it was the Woodstock Music Festival. People forget that Woodstock is in the Catskills. Right. So that was, you know, defined a generation. Right. Did we, it's my generation. You know, that was the year I graduated high school. But, um, where were you? In West Covina, California, <laughs> going to Disneyland. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> no. Actually, the next year I got a job, but my first job in college was at Disneyland. But it, be that as it may, um, I didn't, I, to this day, I didn't like, I don't like rock music, <laughs> but that, that was it. I mean, that defined it, you know, but the ideals that were being promoted at Woodstock, peace and love. Well, you see what, where the world is today. We have my generation to blame. And there again, this fantasy of the kind of the life that you wanted and you couldn't find elsewhere. Right. It just keeps popping up there. It was relaxing. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't cheap, but in a way it was... You know, you got your money's worth. It was all you could eat. That alone. I mean, I have hysterical stories. No, no, the resorts. Oh, you're, oh, you're saying the fantasy of Woodstock. Yeah. Well, Woodstock was a large, loud protest against the war in Vietnam. That's what that was, and right, and rightly so. Well, alongside a bunch of people doing substances. Well, and, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. But, you know. And there's a whole generation of hippies and what have you yeah. up there. Yeah. Still, yeah. these aren't people who shop at Bergdorf Goodman. Right. And today you've got, you actually still have this, the, these two very, di or th two or three very different Catskills cultures going on. Oh, there are a lot. I mean, first of all, there's a whole Hamptons-like culture up there, except the, the real estate value. The property doesn't cost as much, but there are multi-million dollar homes being built up there. There's a lot of gentrification going on, microbreweries, bakeries, bed and breakfast. There are also large pockets of poverty. There are, there's also a very large Hasidic community. And you have a Hasidic community in a couple of ways. You've got kind of the year-round Hasidic yes. communities. And now you have a, a growing n new bungalow culture yes. where hundreds of thousands of, of ultra-Orthodox are going to some yes. places. And that's leading to pushback, too, to new zoning laws and what have you. Yeah. Uh, there are clashes with other members of the community in no. those situations. Um, and at the same time, as the farming community is sometimes reasserting right. itself in different ways. Yeah. And how is that culture going on now? Well, <laughs> the Casco is still defining itself, amazingly. Uh, you know, it's updating, but uh, nothing's written in stone, and it, it is evolving. But, uh, you know, if I'd written this book even four years ago, we'd be concentrating on just how economically depressed the Casco is. They're not anymore. Right. We, uh, we've moved beyond that. Uh, the New York Times practically every weekend, you know, in advising what is there to do this weekend, will list the Catskills. Condé Nast Traveler, or the New York Times, whichever it was, I forget, named it one of the top ten uh, spots to visit this year. So the Catskills are hot. Yeah. Go no. <laughs> <laughs> and so as a Catskills I'm going this weekend <laughs> to speak about the book, but even <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I guess that as a Casa story of reinvention, yes, you know, catch absolutely. It, make sure you visit, or you might miss it. Right. Yeah. Right? Well, but if you don't visit it this weekend, what happens next weekend will be different from this weekend anyway. But again, you bring your own vision of what it is you want to do. You'll find it. It's a great, uh, it's a great message for tourists. Stephen Silverman, thank you for joining us. Stephen, thank you. And now Cheryl Clawson takes us back nearly ten thousand years to where we live right now. One of the things that you unpack a lot is the idea that in archaeology there's been 
interpretation of what people have found and that there was a period when people chose not to view it as religious stuff as ritualistic stuff that there was well this is for farming and this is for home and so on and so forth but what but part of what you're trying to do is to go through everything that's come before and through to today and say well wait a second what what did people believe about these things so how do you get to that different perspective about something First off, I have to say I've been a product of the eras that I've been practicing archaeology in. So um, when I was an undergraduate and a graduate student, uh, there were great voices in archaeology who were saying, we can't know anything about thought. All we can do is look at material culture and, and uh, do economic-based models. Um, I, so I was... Uh, I trained in what my specialty is archaeological shell, um, malacology, and, and so I did all the economic things and I actually got bored. Um, and I think I've said everything I have to say about shell, um, but it did lead me in trying to understand why people would have heaped up huge mounds of shell that I talk about in this book. Um, it led me to trying to look at the context of these shell heaps and uh, realizing that there were caves nearby and um, that there were uh, elements of practice inside of caves that suggested ritual. And then I started thinking about these shell heaps uh, in Kentucky and Tennessee as being part of a ritual, um, a ritual circuit, an annual cycle of activities. Well, I'm, I'm coming to that realization sort of at the same time other people in archaeology are also getting bored with the economic emphasis and um, realizing that they really can say more than they've been saying about the pottery they've been studying or the sites they've been studying or the animal bone they've been studying or whatever, that there, there is more there. And how do you get to that more? Because we're talking about mostly prehistoric uh, stuff here, where, where you've got, you have nothing written to guide you. Uh, well, you get there, um, I mean, it starts with, uh, with in the field, when you're noting context. If you're always finding um, pieces of ground stone, like matates, in a certain uh, uh, association with one another, or uh, in a certain distance from a burial area or always in the context of um, large stones, large flat stones or something, you begin to, you begin to notice patterns. So noticing patterns in the field, uh, reading, documenting, pat documenting stuff and then saying, oh, I think this is a pattern. As you read across other people's sites, you start to have questions about it. The other thing is when you bring all the stuff back to the lab, uh, we screen things through um, really fine mesh screen and you're sitting in the lab sorting really fine mesh screen things and you start to think about color. You know, you may have a thousand little chips of stone um, that you, on your tray that you're sorting but then you notice that some of them are yellow and some of them are red and some of them are blue and some of them are black and some of them are white and you begin to wonder while you're sitting there for hours, you know, is there color symbolism here that, that I've been missing? Um, is, is size, you know, what are the little tiny animals that, that I'm getting in my screens? We assume that they've fallen into a pit or they, they died naturally in a cave or they died naturally uh, in the setting that we've got. If they're little salamanders or snakes or squirrels or bats or rats or moles, but what if they weren't? What if there's, um, you know, what if there's something more to the size business and then you, you also read, you know, you can't just, you're not just um, digging and, and processing, but you're also reading. And so you might happen, like I did, to pick up a book and read about what sorts of things constitute offerings today in central Mexico. And small size is real important. The idea of perspective that a long time ago makes things really small. So songbirds and baby animals are um, suitable offerings for the most ancient of the deities. So you're sitting there sorting the stuff in the lab and going, well, I've got color here. I've got certain species of animals that are small. Maybe you always find the left side, uh, uh, bones that are coming from the left side. And again, we have, uh, you can read um, contemporary accounts of offerings where the left is, um, um, 
it's counterclockwise, and that's, that has all kinds of symbolism to it. So you begin to note things that you've always noted, but you just, it just never clicked. And it's difficult, probably, to try to get inside that head, not just in the sense that this is someone who lived 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, and you can't talk to them, uh, and you can't read anything that they wrote, but, but also there's how we understand religion is heavily influenced by Western religion, and, and what we might think uh, what we might think stands out as a religious act, as a religious symbol, as a religious distinction. It can be, it can be difficult to, to get one's mind around that, but, mm -hmm. but how does that wall get broken down? In my own case, which is the one I can talk about the most, uh, it, it was just reading contemporary materials and going, I've seen that in, in the archaeological record. I've seen that in the eastern U.S. I've, um, we, we have a, I mean, I, I don't know how somebody does it who's just starting out in archaeology because they haven't had all the patterns building up. Um, but, but for those of us who have been doing it for a long time, we carry around these things that we saw on a site 20 years ago. I, I excavated for seven years north of New York City at Croton Point on a 6,000 to 7,000 year old site up there at, at Croton Point, Dogen Point. And um, I mean, I'm still carrying around in my mind visual images of associations of artifacts that I can't explain. But I might pick up a book from Mesoamerica and read something about a contemporary practice that puts those very same objects in that very same association. I go, oh, I wonder if that, you, have a, you now have a hypothesis for what that could be. And then you've got to figure out, okay, what, what are the elements that I can check to bear against this hypothesis that I've now formed. You know, what can I look for? Is it color? Is it size? Is it quantity? Is it place? Is it... And amid all that, what, one of the approaches that, you're, that you talk about is the idea that there simply are things that, that seem to universally create religious <coughs> structure, religious belief. Uh, that that these are just these are part of the human experience across continents, across thousands of years, across hemispheres. And and I see so much in doing this research in the last fifteen years. I've come across so many things that I think this is this is human. This is science. If we're gonna if science is gonna be observation, this is observation. People worldwide have observed uh, temperature differentials in the mouth of caves. You don't have to have contact between ancient Russians and ancient Mesoamericanists to explain why they would do similar, have similar beliefs about caves. You know, water, rivers that run through caves, those, those are the, that's the most sacred water. It's, it's the purest, the stalactite water. Cultures worldwide believe that that's the purest water. Um, you know, there's all kinds of physical phenomenon with, uh, with quartz crystals. You don't have to have contact between cultures. Um, there's, um, you know, observations about life histories of animals and plants that lead people to the same, the same, to the same point. And then they just dress up these observations differently. Um, in, in my mind, Observation equals science. Explanation equals religion. And I would throw science in with that. Um, you know, trying to make sense of it is when you get into the realm of science. But everybody's pretty much starting from the same observational base for things. And, and so when they observe something, they observe thunder-lightning relationships, uh, or they observe uh, wet season, dry season, um, color changes in the night sky or uh, whatever, these can be observed worldwide and, and you just get it packaged differently. You'll get it packagedly, packaged differently in the Americas over time. I think there's this great well or this great pool of symbolism um, that people have just sort of drawn and repackaged over over the deck over the millennia, and I think these are these constitute cults. I think most of religious practice in the past has been in the form of cults, uh, and they and cults start with a dreamer, 
Um, they, they start with some sort of vision, some individual who convinces people to play along for the duration of that life person's lifespan, or maybe it carries on another generation or whatever. But I think we, what we see archeologically is the fading and fluorescing of, of cults. That could be a goose cult, it could be a, a snail shell cult, it could be a um, red feather cult, um, just all kinds of minor and major sorts of beliefs about something that, that people think, wow, that, that makes sense. And, I can do that, and so they do. And amid all of that universal sensibility, a lot of what you're documenting here is, is, these, is these distinctions, and distinctions that sometimes are surprisingly stable, where you have, uh, you're talking about populations that come in uh, from different parts of what is now North America across that 8,000 years ago, there mm -hmm. were people in, in this valley, and then you know, 7,000 years ago, here come some people, <coughs> here come some people from the West. And you're mapping out t beliefs that are stable and communities that are stable and times, and times of, of change. And, and it seems like there are points I over the last 50 years or so in archaeology where people have been continually surprised that, oh, people exchange ideas. Oh wait, maybe they didn't so much. Oh wait, they did. They did to a degree. Uh huh. And part of that surprise, um, we pick up in in language. Like archaeologists are a product of our social milieu, so we have we talk about warfare, or we talk about um, um, violence against other individuals. And so if we see uh, a skeleton that's got an embedded point in it, it's warfare. And in here, uh, I'm trying to document that um, I don't that that warfare is a different beast than um, capturing somebody for a sacrificial role and a right that you're playing. Right. So human sacrifice. This is a big topic. Right. It's a big topic in here. Um, there's lots of evidence for it. Uh, there's evidence for infant sacrifice in in the eastern United States. There's evidence for adult sacrifice. There's evidence for rituals that would involve four people or five people, adults. There's evidence for rituals where you'd sacrifice somebody of the four different ages, all in the same right. There are dog sacrifice, dog sacrifices. There are, um, uh, and certainly I'm sure there's all kinds of, of animal offerings. We, we call them sacrifices if they're humans and offerings if they're small animals or whatever, but yes, I think there's a lot of evidence for that, and we'll see it in, in, in really uh, unusual burial practices. It's not just the embedded points, but it could be the body that's face down. Um, we've got torso-only burials, no arms, no heads, no legs. We've got burials with nothing on the left side. Um, I think these are trophy parts. And then if we look around the landscape, someplace like Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, you'll, you can find a huge deposit of what looked to be, to me anyway, look like trophy parts. So people have brought the legs and they've brought the arms and they've brought the heads um, that they cut off of somebody else and they do this decommissioning right um, in the vestibule of Mammoth Cave. And one of the things that, that you come upon with your, your discussion of, of human sacrifice in these cultures is that when you think about it, it, it's hard to imagine how human sacrifice sustained itself as a ritual because it's, it's kind of like the shakers. You run out of your employees, right? A and uh, if you're not reproducing properly. Uh, but one of your insights is that, that they, don't, they don't kill their own. They go and get somebody from a from a neighboring area, and and one can imagine that's probably part of why ideas had a problem spreading. If every time you come upon someone, they're trying to take one of you away and, and right. sacrifice them to their gods. No, the Aztecs had that problem. As long as they had people to conquer, um, they were they would bring in adults from outside their community for sacrifices. But once they'd conquered an extensive um, neighborhood, then they were. Um, they ran out killing of their own citizens, yeah. and and therein lies revolt. Yeah. Uh, we also have uh, other concepts in archaeology, such as trade. And uh, again, archaeologists are very quick when we find an exotic thing. 
um, when we, in the era, in the decades when we weren't thinking about ritual, to think in terms of trade. Uh, the economic model. That's what we're supposed to be doing, is looking for ancient economics. But I think, in fact, that a lot of these materials are moving around as offerings, that pilgrims are coming in, pilgrimages are happening, they're bringing materials um, that they're depositing, and maybe they get some of their offerings right before they get to the shrine, uh, a place like Indian Knoll, a site in Kentucky, uh, or a place like um, um, Turner Farm in Maine, maybe they get some of their offerings somewhere just before they get there and then deposit them. But I think a lot of these are being brought from wherever their homelands are. Um, the other thing that's happening is with the close, with the sort of the end of the Ice Age, and these populations are moving around as they attempt to adjust to changing climate. They've got to follow the vegetation that they're used to, follow the animals that are following that vegetation, and move into new places. I think. I think there's a, um, an ethnicity, an ethnogenesis um, that's stimulated and, um, and, and getting the stone that you're familiar with into your new place is, is an important thing to do. And I think fetching, I mean, trade is a difficult thing to demonstrate. Um, when there are all these other avenues for moving material goods around the landscape, pilgrimages, offerings, fetchings. Um, if you go on a if you go on a vision quest, what better way to prove where you've been than to bring something back? Yeah, bring something back that nobody else <laughs> has seen or knows it doesn't come from there. It, there. There are a lot of ways in which one can see the interaction between economics and religion. Is is it, there? There's a lot of overlap there, and and what one of the ways in which you see it is well, these objects are perceived as valuable. Why? Because we believe it's so, right? And it's mm -hmm. in the same way that I will, you know, people believe a dollar is worth a dollar, and you know mm -hmm. you have these fiat currencies, and 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 you have shells that people decide. Well, these are these are worthwhile. The, these are worth something. It's a belief, and then it, it it kind of makes sense that that belief would be transferred into the broader realm of belief that we think of when we when we think about belief today. Shells are an excellent example of a worldwide belief, but they come from the underworld. And um, the underworld worldwide for millions of years, I think, has been the source of, we've believed it to be the source of new people. I mean, why do Christians stick burials in the ground? It's because the ground is well, the source the of new people. Right, but they could cremate. Um, and, and most of our Native Americans did cremate. Um, shells then are these fertility. Uh, symbols. So, you know the the pilgrimage that people may be familiar with of Santiago in Compostela, Spain, was thousands of years old as a pagan pilgrimage for people who got married going to the west where gestation begins um, at the sea coast. And um, when the sun sets, it dies, and with death in the west comes new life, comes gestation. So while the sun is passing through the underworld, it's going to be born in the east. So shells are associated with that gestation idea, plus the fact that they spit out thousands of glochidia that all get fertilized and become other little shells. Um, but in North America, in, in Europe, in you know, India, we can see um, deities holding shells while uh, associated with the sea and all. I mean, shells are an excellent worldwide symbol of, of fertility. Right, and shared practices and shared stories are, is something that we that we see more than just there. But this, there, you talk about world renewal rights. You're talking about stories of great floods. There's a lot there that even just from a, from a narrative perspective, you'd remember if you grew up in Western religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and. What are some of those things that are shared, and why do you think those end up being things that, that cross those cultures? It, I think it's observant people, our ancestors. Right. We're very but, observant. And but stories like, uh, like floods. Like the floods. I think the floods are referring to the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, the end of the Ice Age, and you've got uh, from 20,000 years ago to 14,000 years ago, the glaciers are melting, sea level is rising worldwide. 
sea level is rising. There are a few places like Maine where the actual, the shoreline is rising because the glaciers were so heavy um, that as they melted, the shore was actually able to rebound. But for most of the world, water levels are coming up and flooding ancient, um, flooding familiar locations. They're flooding the, the cenotes and the caves of Florida and, and the Yucatan. Their uh, river valleys are drowning and the Potomac Valley is being formed. Um, uh, landscapes are changing in fairly dramatic ways and in some cases within, certainly within two generations, you could have a grandparent saying, well, we used to practice this ritual there, but now it's underwater. Um, you also had with the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, um, the extinction of the megafauna. And I think this is the basis for the Big, idea. Big scary animals. Yeah, the, the giant, um, the mammoth, the mastodon, the giant saber-toothed tiger, the giant ground sloth, the cave bear, um, the giant tortoise, those all go extinct, but where they, but in many cases, they're found in shallow water fossil beds now. So Big Bend or Big Lick in um, Kentucky, there on the Ohio, there are fossil beds that are in shallow water on the um, Missouri and on the Mississippi. Um, the fossil shark's teeth. I mean, people, again, observant people are coming up with big chunks of big animals. You get in the Delaware River Valley, you've got um, um, bird, dinosaur footprints. You've got giant footprints all along um, the Delaware River through the valley, and people are observing these things. And they all come up then with this idea of a first creation, of an older, of an older world. Um, and the ancestors, the, the, so that ancestors are of different, different calibers. They're the ancestors from the first creation, they're the ancestors from our own lineage. Um, and those are different, different categories of ancestors, and the further back they are, the more, the more deity-like um, they are. So I think fossils and the, like I said, this, the melting of the glaciers, um, we've been in a warming climate for 20,000 years, um, that these all create um, um, stories that people around the world have landscapes that they've lost, places that they've lost, and they can see these, these um, prior forms of life. And which gives us a very different perspective on ancient people, because when you think about it, that you know, the time from some of the first recordings of these stories, I and mean, if you go back to when the story, those a story like that would have originated, you're talking about 8,000, 10,000, 10, 12,000 years. years. For a story. Yes. Where we have enough trouble agreeing on what happened yesterday uh, mm -hmm. in today's culture. But also, you know, we have, the, the, we know that the transmission of stories from 2,000 and 3,000 years ago was very murky when people were writing. And mm -hmm. people were and people were writing these stories down, and just the, them being written over and over over thousands of years really changed things. And it gives you, in one sense, a respect for the culture. Also, it, it's something that that it, it raises this curious thing about an earlier age of archaeology, where to not assume that there was all this ritual and belief to be found when it's so common when looking at you know, older ancestors to say, well, they were so superstitious and, they, and everything was about mm -hmm. that and to find only the economic and the rational mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. We've got, again, famous archaeologists in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s who said flat out um, that there was no point in doing ethnography, um, that, that, that those are just made up stories. Um, I have a, but I, but I think to show you how we've changed, I've got a colleague on his door, he has this saying that says, stories are the lies that tell the truth. Um, so there's truth, we understand now there to be truth in stories. I mean, native peoples are probably chuckling if they're watching. And you know, it, it takes white people so long to learn everything. I mean, we've got to discover this and that, and we've got to realize that there really is truth in oral history and um, it's, it's amazing that we've ever managed to accomplish anything because we have to reinvent everything. We doubt everything and reinvent everything. 
Um, but no, we've got, we've got uh, Native peoples now in California who are co-authoring with archaeologists, writing down stories and then combining the archaeological evidence with those stories to document 10,000 to 12,000 years worth of accuracy, the stories that tell the truth. Oh, well, let's see how the next 10,000 years go. Cheryl yes. Clausen, thank you for joining us. <laughs> sure. That's all for this week's episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can also listen to an audio-only version of this program as a free podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Link Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast and the on-demand menu on TV channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.